Hi, this is Gat Dryden, you're watching Torrent's YouTube channel. Now, I'm no cornerback like legendary Falcons, Cowboys, and 49ers, Dion Sanders. But I gotta holler back at you, like he would. Because eSports pools is prime time. So I gotta back at you, man. The way these boys run the betting game, they're laid back in a cherry red coop with their pinky out just lounging. Hall of Fame, man. I'm talking in-play betting legendary. Get you a gold jacket and it didn't cost nothing. Now, Exist has been benched by NIP. Dennis has joined replacing him and has taken over as the in-game leader. <clears throat> And it was actually confirmed in a comment on the NIP website that indeed Dennis would be taking over as the in-game leader. Now, let's start out, usual formula. Should NIP have removed Exist? Right, yes, this is the correct move at this point in time. It would have been the correct move a number of years in the past. And I think this is a move that was a long time coming and quite frankly is overdue because I do think Exist has been a liability within NIP for the last couple of years within the context, and I should say this now, just as I actually neglected to say this in my Virtus Pro video about Taz, when I say that these players are liabilities, now yes, both of these teams, NIP and Virtus Pro, are no longer at an elite world-class level where you expect them to win majors, expect them to win massive tournaments. They're not teams that are going to dominate the top three spots in the rankings and constantly battle with in the modern day SK and FaZe or in years gone past, SK Gaming, Luminosity, Na'Vi, Fnatic. They, they weren't up there. They were teams that would either have really good runs, so a few months of form in terms, in terms of Virtus Pro, or they would have tournaments like NIP where it was nip magic and it all came together and it was very good. But... The problem is, at different points in time, these teams have been world-class championship-level teams, and it is neglecting to make key roster moves, including cutting players like this, who aren't bad outright necessarily, although in the latter years you could make a case for Exist, but had started to degrade and didn't contribute as much to the team, and then other elements of the team fell apart, so you needed to reconstruct the team, not just upgrade, but reformulate the way the team ran, and instead these particular cores didn't, and ran the same approach into the ground, essentially with some minor tweaks, you know, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, as we say. And so it, that's why he's a liability. Because, yeah, you know what? They won a few tournaments with him in the last couple of years. Last year, even, they won a tournament or two. But how many more tournaments could they have won if they'd have made a roster move three years ago? If they'd have made one two years ago for the right player, made the right upgrade. You look at the teams that make the, the killer roster moves. So you think of teams like... Well, I mean, obvious examples would be like, um, I mean, I'd have to say number one is SK. I think they've been the most ruthless and they've made the right decisions a lot of the time. Fnatic squads obviously have been and gone. They've overtaken NIP squads again and again and overall had much more success. I think you can look at the rest of the scene, phase, obvious example. It makes more sense to make these roster moves. There isn't really a good case for staying as long. So back to uh, exist. It's been a liability for a few years. You've got to look at who he is as a player and in the context of Nip. Now, he was a very good fragging in-game leader for the first two years or so. But by the time we got to late 2014, and especially for 2015, his level had dropped massively in both regards, but especially in terms of his fragging. 2016 came along, he had some spikes, but they were more like the exception to the rule. And pretty much all of his tournament spikes with the big NIP tournament wins. They were Dream Mac Malmo, Star Series Season 2, IEM Oakland. So when they didn't do that well at all those other tournaments and actually were fairly lackluster and were just like a bottom half of the top 10 ranked team, he's part of the reason why. And so having three tournaments in a year or four tournaments in a year where you shine, that's not really good enough, quite frankly. And his overall day-to-day -day level wasn't really at the level that they needed to if they were going to be a team in the top four or top five of the rankings. Now, in 2017, okay, he was decent early, but he's been a massive liability since. He's always remained throughout his time, especially when his fragging generally dropped off and as an in-game leader, he was somewhat irrelevant. He's always been a clutch player, I'll give him that. And in the big, big pressure matches, he always is sort of good for one or two kind of key 1v1s or 1v2s. But that's not enough. That doesn't add up as a plus 
to all the minuses and make the overall equation, yeah, this is a good enough player or he fits NIP so well that you have to keep him. So I think his issue is twofold. It is individually and it is as an in-game leader. You look at 2016 and 2017 where he had something of a return to form and I don't really even buy it because even then the numbers aren't that great. Even then his contribution isn't that crazy. He's just another player in the mix. And as an in-game leader, he has threat behind him now. He has threat fully calling behind him in 2016. Then after the coaching change, he has threat coming in and all these timeouts and coming up with the game plans, helping them switch up their veto. So I think the coaching rule change in two senses, coaching changing in terms of having them and having them in game leaders and getting threat then. And then the coaching rule change where you have to keep an in game leader, but have the coach have some input actually extended this guy's career massively to where I think he would have really fallen off otherwise. And that's why at the end of 2015, if you remember, he was going to be out of NIP entirely, perhaps, where they were going to make that super team. Well, it wasn't really a super team. It was just a, an interesting team where it would have been some of the then G2, later phase players, and exist in Forest, which I think would have been an interesting team and might have been a different direction he could have gone. But I think at that point in time, that is when it should almost certainly have ended. He had run his course at that point in time. I also have to say, it's hard to give him much credit in-game leading-wise because some of it, so much of it seemed to come from threat. I mean, especially if you look at that last term that they won at IEM Oakland, that was almost all threat in the timeout, seemingly. The vetoes improved massively under threat. Again, I can't imagine that's some sort of con con coincidence. Their style seemed to adapt to the players they brought in a lot better than before when it was just Exist running the show or when they had Peter as a coach and Nato as a coach. I mean, apparently, since they were a team that was quite resistant to coaching from those two guys, I have to wonder what was Exist's role there because you want your coach to be on the same page as your in-game leader and him to be your general on the field. So I get the feeling he's a guy who's been a very stubborn in-game leader seemingly. I have to figure some of the disconnect stem from him. I do think that they had some amazing one-off tournament runs over those two years, 2016, 2017, for a team who, quite frankly, shouldn't have been anywhere close to the top five in terms of rankings. So winning big tournaments, if you're not a team in that position, is impressive. But then the consistency is non-existent the last few years. And generally, it is underwhelming results with these occasional crazy ceiling games. But even then, narrowly winning. They were never dominating any of these tournaments and having amazing form. They were very narrowly winning all these events. And with key, amazing Nip Magic type wins, there was never any dominance seen. So in terms of in-game leading, we've got to be real. Even if we go right back to the beginning, he was never that sick at the actual in-game leading part. He was a very good fragger. And so he, he was more a fragger first and then an in-game leader as the secondary quality. And that's really what NIP needed in the early days of CSGO. Because the early days of CSGO for NIP was everyone get the fuck out of Forest and, and get right's way. Let them work. And if they go to work and play to their styles and how they want to play as, be as best as possible, we're going to win games because these are two of the absolute best players in the game. And I actually don't get right, by far the best player in the game, the most all-around complete player. So that formula was amazing, but it only worked as long as those two star players were at the same stature that they were at. Even then, look at the context of that team. So you had Get Right and you had Forest, two of the best players in the world doing exactly what they wanted, very different ends of the game and styles and impacts. Therefore, you're already creating a, a complete kind of round concept. Then who else did you have in the team aside from Exist? You've got Fiflaren, who's clearly playing more of a supportive element, who knows that his role on team's not to frag and that he's got to set people up or support up. And then you've got Freiburg, this aggressive entry player who's playing without a whole lot of utility, but at the time had very good spray and it's creating a lot for Forest, which then sets up the game. These guys had such clearly defined roles that don't seem to stem from Exist as an in-game leader or some sort of tactical prowess and puppet mastery of the game that for Exist, really, in terms of in-game leading, there's not a whole lot. You're playing fairly default and you're playing off your star players. You're just creating space for them. And all you have to do, admittedly, this is no all you have to do, is just frag. And then, if you can be clutch, as he was, you win some big rounds every now and then. Okay, so in his team, I will say, I do think he made up part of the clutch element. I do think he was part of the Nip Magic core, quite frankly, because for me, the main clutch players in the team was Get Right first and foremost, obviously, and then it was actually Exist. These were the guys. Now, Freiburg in his own way could be clutch, obviously not winning clutches, but he was a big game player, especially for those first two or so years. Whereas Forrest has always been up and down in these big moments. You never know if he'll show up or if he'll just be quiet. You don't really think of him as a super clutch player. Obviously, you think of someone like Fiflaren, not really a particularly clutch player, not someone who's a massive big game player necessarily. You know, in that context, I've got to give Exist some credit. Like, I do think he brought some of the character of NIP in that sense, that kind of never say die, can't count them out of a game, they can win a map, it's your map. But that plays into, unfortunately, a big downside that I think he brought with him, which was that during his tenure as the main in-game leader and the main voice in this sense, 
he was a guy who did some very silly vetoes. And I really should do some content highlighting this someday because even if when it worked on those like sort of one out of three times, it produced some epic games like the classic drobbing of Envious at uh, ESL 1 Katowice 2015 in the semi-final where the maps are cash and dust too, the best two Envious maps, and you smash them on it. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. There's something ballsy about that. It's epic. It defined the nip style where they could beat you even if it was your maps. But... It did lead to a lot of losses, and it led to a lot of humiliating losses and a lot of series where actually an IP didn't have as good chances as they might otherwise have if they'd have really played the veto properly. So he's one of those guys I always thought typified that classic saying from Blade where that guy, where he just says, some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate uphill. And that is what Exist had NIP doing in terms of the veto. And the veto for over the years has become more and more significant, especially as we've had these different tweaked maps come in from month to month. And I know that Nip was a team where you talk to some of those other players, they didn't know what they were going to be playing in the veto. They didn't even necessarily know what was supposed to be all the strongest Nip maps or what the maps that the enemy played because they knew Exist was going to handle that and they just kind of left it to him and said, hey, we'll play whatever. So, okay, he had the right team to pull this style off with, but I don't think it was as consistent as it should have been. I think you look at teams like Fnatic, you look at the poll, you look at SK Gaming, you look at the TSM Astralis cause, there's reason why these teams manipulated the veto and had a pretty good amount of consistency as teams where NIP didn't for the last three or four years and just had to go on these amazing streaks and sometimes win the opponent's map. So I do think that one thing that's worth pointing out, because not a lot of people know this, is something I've talked to Fifth Lauren about, is that actually Nip could have gone a different route with him. They could have made him more of a supportive player and actually made Fifth Lauren an in-game leader because they were trying that. I think it was late 2013 into early 2014. I know at Kadavice, the famous loss to Virtus Pro, Fifth Lauren was the in-game leader. Not only was he individually playing a lot better than he had before, but his in-game leading style actually seemed a lot more consistent than exists because actually Fifth Lauren's got a decent tactical mind and he has a good knowledge of what what other teams are doing and who's come up with stuff and some of the basic reads because you look at his style of play that's what it was more about and I actually thought this was a more consistent NIP I would have liked to have seen this one going forwards in 2014 but because of that epic loss to Virtus Pro Exist took back in-game leadership and from then on it was him onwards and obviously Fifth Lion was gone from the team in like what five or, well I mean more like about seven or eight months I guess now I don't think, actually, that Nip loses anything by letting him go at this point in time, which tells you they waited too long. They should have been the ones who were getting different players and in place of Exist a long time before. Because as an in-game leader, he wasn't bringing enough that he was somehow essential in that sense. Think of the players they could have gotten. First of all, they could have had Dennis two or three times in the history of CSGO and they never got him. Never at any point in time. They could have gone after Pronax after he left Fnatic. Didn't get him. Could have gone after Golden before he joined Fnatic unwilling to give him a try. They could have gone after Faze, uh, Carrigan rather, before he went to Faze. What an interesting pick that up would have been. He's a guy who likes to play a freer style, likes to use different star players, figures out a system that works around them, manipulates the veto very well. What a dream pickup that would be. Yeah, you can't speak Swedish, but first of all, they've already played with players who weren't speaking in Swedish, like Alu. And secondly, I don't think speaking in Swedish anymore is enough of a boost for them over what they would have gained or what they would have lost, rather, by not taking on someone like a Carrigan. Instead, they've let all this talent go. They've had so many players that could have been players that weren't, and they've ended up having to make the best of, like, oh, maybe this guy could work out, and they've never made that move to pick up the in-game leader instead of Exist. Now, in terms of Dennis replacing him, so yes, Exist was the right player to remove. Is Dennis the right player to replace him? Absolutely, because... First and foremost, he's the best pickup that's available right now. I mean, in terms of you're going to remove anyone else, you don't really want to remove Drake and he's a primary AWPer. Rez has only just come into the team and has shown a little bit of form, even though I think he has been somewhat lackluster. But it's kind of too soon to jettison them at this point in time. How can you give, like, Exist and Freiburg years of extra players they're bad if you're just going to kick these guys straight out the team? It's also the fact that I think Dennis it can do everything Exist can do and more and at a higher level, quite frankly. So he can in-game lead. I know he hasn't wanted to, but for the sake of this opportunity, I think it's worth it. Not least because he's not going to have the in-game lead tactically. This is going to be a very loose style, which is what he has always played in all his teams. In LGB with Olaf Meister and Crimson Twist. In the Kingwin G2 team. In the Fnatic that he replaced Pronax in. It's always been about this loose playing style. He obviously had a su reasonable success almost winning Blast Pro Series with Astralis, who was playing more of a looser style and let him kind of just do whatever he wanted on both sides. So I feel like he is the right player to be forced to be an in-game leader, but for a team like Nip, who wants to go back to that route seemingly. 
Now, individually, he's a pretty good all-round player. He gives Nip some legit firepower. I think this actually puts them already at the level of a mouse spots type team. If you look top to bottom, the kind of firepower they have, and they have fairly defined roles, quite frankly. I don't think Nip Denifus is going to be a superstar player, nor do I think he needs to be, quite frankly. I think in an ideal world, he's your second or third best player, and therefore his impact and his high skill level is going to put you over the top in big games. You probably want another superstar, which is probably where Nip's actually in a bit of trouble right now. I also think he should be the secondary opera at times in this team, but he doesn't have to be. He's a very good rifle player. His pistol round impact definitely helps. I mean, put it this way, you have him and you have Forrest, already that's going to be some, some fun times on pistol rounds. You can see him winning some rounds by himself right there. Gives you a little boost to start the game out with. Now then, let's look at him as a player. First and foremost, the first thing you should mention when you talk about Dennis isn't pistol rounds. It isn't, you know, balls, ballsy kind of play, like a aggressive playing style. I actually think the first thing, and the thing that doesn't get mentioned enough with him, it doesn't seem to be associated with him. I guess it is secondarily through people knowing he's a pistol king, is that this guy doesn't just have good aim. In terms of first couple of bullets... He has some of the best aim I've seen of any Swedish player in CSGO. Like, the more I watched this guy's POVs, and I went back and watched a bunch of games throughout different periods of time, man alive, this guy's aim is good. He has a really nice first few bullets. It's especially noticeable with the USP, but also with the AK. It's fucking deadly, because obviously the AK is a weapon where if you can tap or hit those first two or three bullets with the burst, you will take over a game. Now... In terms of his style in that sense, I noticed on his Liquipedia, it doesn't seem like his sensitivity is set high, but he looks like a high sensitivity player. He has really fast transitions between people. He's flicking on and he can do 180s very, very quickly. So I don't know if that's just speed in his hands or if he is using a high sensitivity for some of these games. But that's one of the things that's bizarre about him as a player. As I'll get to some of his other skill set, we'll loop back on the really good aim. And actually, it leads to something that's a little bit paradoxical, uh, uh, paradoxical about him. So obviously, yes, he has a fucking amazing USP. Probably the best USP player ever in CSGO, if I'm being honest. I think it's between him and Forrest and Rain. These are the players who really come to mind, who just dominate nearly all the time on pistols. He's also got a pretty good deagle, which you actually see him use not just on Ecos, but you even see him sometimes use it when he's on T-side, when... This seems won the pistol. He's got a very nice M4A4 and AK crouch spray. Like, just go watch him when he crouch sprays with the M4A4. He is deadly. He doesn't miss that first kill if he gets the crosshair anywhere near you. It's a guaranteed kill. And then his ability to either spray transition, transfer onto the second guy, or reset and then spray after moving is really, really nice. Really strong gun skills in that sense. As a result of having this really good first bullet aim, having amazing pistols, amazing rifles, and being good at spraying, and therefore taking on multiple people, this is a contact style player. On CT, this guy is constantly pushing, he's constantly repositioning, he likes to play advanced positions, sometimes by himself, moves around a lot, readjusts a lot. Even when they take the site, he wants to be one of the first people pushing through the smoke to, re to retake. He was willing to go first while other people follow up. The guy loves to take battles, loves to take fights, loves to take those hard angles and just take a, a raw duel. On the T side, you will see him willingly entry. He'll take up the advanced positions. The guy just loves to fight. You look at him over his career. Okay, so in LGB, I thought he was actually the best along with Olaf Meister, who was the clear best player and the rising talent. King win, he turned them around. It was him and Rain were the real stars for me. You go to Fnatic. Okay, early on, when they were winning all the tournaments, bizarrely, he was actually somewhat surplus to requirements. It was at that time about Olaf Meister and then Flusher and then a bit of Crims. He was actually more of just like left in the back, winning some pistol rounds, hitting some crazy shots. But he didn't have to be a big fragger, big star player. Now, when Olofmeister had his injury and went out, Dennis seemingly took up the space beyond that. Without an Olofmeister, who Dennis had something of a similar game to in terms of his aggressive style and all-around rifle skills, then suddenly he became like the best player in Fnatic and he became a pretty solid player around the middle of 2016. God said, I can't say much about it. They barely played any tournaments and he, it was just a waste of time for everyone and, and he did seem to languish there. Astralis, he came in as the stand-in at Blast Pro Series. A lot of people won't notice this because Dupree had the big moments in the playoff final where they almost won the tournament. He was the best player statistically. This was a guy, I mean, I, I actually, I'm not sure that, but he had very good statistics. And for me, he was the best player for them in the group stage and was dominating some of those games, especially the CT sides. Now, here's the paradox. For someone who doesn't just have good aim, but go watch some of these POVs, like actually absurdly good spray. Like it's so, so consistent. And then those first two few bullets with the USP and AK are fucking bonkers. That when you think about it, how is this guy not a superstar player? Unfortunately, he's not. 
because of his style of play being so aggressive and him wanting so much to get contact with the enemy and then not falling back and holding angles as much and playing in that particular sense. Being so aggro means that he gives up a lot of deaths. So he's good for streaky two or three kill rounds, but then he's going to almost certainly die in these rounds and in lots and lots of matches. And he's not going to be left alive a whole lot. So for me, that reduces you because you're giving up kills as well as getting them. It makes him not a star player, but I think of him as like an impact player. Because he's going to get a lot of kills. He's going to do a lot of deaths as well. So you're going to need someone else to carry you in terms of superstar fragging. You're going to need someone else to be the supportive core that's going to round out the foundation. But put him in the middle of the mix. And now you're cooking with gas as you were in Fnatic, as you were in some of his past teams. And as I think he could be in NIP, if we can get some star play out of Forrest, out of Draken, etc. Because the aggro style means he's not going to put up consistently big numbers. It's not going to happen. But he's going to have those huge maps, and he's going to have maps with very low kills. You've got to have other people who can get you to that party that he can then put you over the top at. You've got other people who can make up for the difference when he's not on his game or he's just dying and not getting those crazy first kills. Now, in NIP, I do think they've got an issue if they want to be number one again in terms of star power. Because Draken's having really big numbers. It's not really impacting the results, though. Get Right has been good but not the old get right and hasn't been dominant for a long time. Forrest has streaky big games that look really nice, but I don't think many people still are going to put him in the top 10. So who is the supportive core? We've already said in terms of stars, they've got some, they've got some pretty solid fragging from top to bottom. They've got Draken, they've got Forrest, they've got Dennis now, they've got Get Right, and he doesn't even have to be a top player necessarily. That's pretty good in terms of fragging, but no clear superstar. Then you go the other end of the equation. Who is the supportive core? I mean, Rez, in theory, is playing more of a role, but he's like an entry player. So where is the supportive element? It's only get right, right? As far as I can tell, he's the only more passive player, more slow range player. That Losing exists means essentially they're somewhat, I think, going all in on being a very aggressive team. And I think that does suit Dennis's style, but they're going to have to go down this route really far. I think they need to be a really aggro team because now they've got Rez, Forrest, Dennis, who can be entry players. You already have Draken, who likes to take aggressive angles. I think they should play a very fast, high-tempo game, play off individual aim. Don't go with super-duper million strats and flashes and pop flashes and double peaks. Just do aggressive strats onto sites. Take aim duels with Forrest. Have Rez rush in. Have Dennis have a little bit of space created for him. That then he can then operate from a little bit slow or go through smokes fast. This is where I could see them being very good. Because at the moment, the bizarre thing for Nip is the best numbers are being put up by Draken. But there is a disconnect between him and his team. Because he has his massive numbers in the games they lose. At the tournament they won, I am Oakland. He was having a terrible tournament, yet they won the tournament. So I feel like they still haven't figured that out. But increasing the tempo, having more aimers in general, I think this could maybe connect up some of his orping with impact and having another streaky impact player. And then you hope players like Forrest and Get Right deliver more of the consistency if possible. I do think this lineup puts a lot of pressure on Rez because the others... I don't think they're going to have a lot of whole, whole lot of team play. So he's going to be in kind of tough positions if he's staying as an entry player. I also think the nip magic era is over. This is going to be more like, let's let's frag out if we want to win these games. They've lost exist. They've got get right still. You know, where's the nip magic? Freiburg was a key nip magic player. I don't really see a whole lot of it left at this point in time. And this is a very different, whereas the last few lineups of NIP, I actually thought went to more towards more of what in theory should have been consistent teams but weren't and were more streaky. This should be more streaky, but you've got a much bigger ceiling, quite frankly. Now, in terms of Exist's future, he said that he'll keep playing, but that is what pretty much everyone says when they get kicked at the moment. And in general, unless you're going to instantly announce your retirement, which you probably haven't fully thought about, people are just going to say that. But I personally do hope he keeps playing, and I hope he joins a Nordic team and continues on, because as a veteran player, as someone with so much experience, as someone who can bring a clutch factor, which is nearly always missing from young players and young teams, I think he could add a lot to a team in that sense. And young teams typically don't have a lot of tactical depth. He can run a loose style and show them some of the basics of how to enable and set star players up. And then when they go to other teams, they can learn the tactical side of things. I don't think he's going to be anywhere near any kind of production for any team, no matter what team he joins, quite frankly. So I do think he could, if he really wanted to, play in like a mouse sports or a similar team, if he was more of the veteran role, more of the stability, more of a supportive core for the superstars. But I don't expect to see him as any kind of fragger. With that said, though, it's hard to know what he'll do in another team because he played all of CSGO with the NIP players. So he synced up well with some of them. He played off some of them well. He made up that supportive core. 
But what would he be like with completely different players and 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 much younger and more inexperienced players? You'd think it would actually mean some of his strengths would dissipate to some degree, even if maybe his fragging slightly takes the increase, but I wouldn't expect a whole lot. Just as with Freiburg, you didn't really see a whole lot of increase in terms of the fragging. This video was supported by Dean Tanglis, Michael Allaire, Andreas Westerland, Alex Adams, G-Man, Twitch Twitch Twitch, Jerky's Minion, Anthony, Tigreb, Jake Petrucci, Jordan Senkov, Daniel Yordanov. Want to get exclusive teasers for my upcoming work? Submit questions for me or make suggestions for my content? Become a part of the ever-growing Skrilluminati via Patreon link in the description box below.